Well, this morning, as we continue our long and tedious journey through this book, no, only joking, <laughs> surprise the world, we come now to Michael Frost's fifth habit or pattern. If you've been at other services and heard some of the sermons, you'll know that we've looked at his habit of blessing others, eating with others, listening to others and to God, and learning Christ. All as ways in which we can be witnesses, we can share the faith that we have in Jesus. And the one he has this morning is quite a challenging one, because today we're going to look at what he calls to begin to identify yourself as a missionary, as one who is sent. Now, for a long time, the term missionary was used exclusively for people who went overseas, particularly from this country, for Europe and from North America, to do Christian work in the rest of the world. When we came back from working in Africa, I used to sometimes go to meetings and people would come up and they would discover that we'd work there and their eyes would open up and they would say, oh, you are a missionary. And I used to feel very embarrassed, really, because we, it was great that God had called us to work in another part of the world. We received so much from it working in another culture, and it was uh, really a great experience for us. But they had this sort of funny idea that, you know, missionaries were some old people on a pedestal who went off and did great things in other parts of the world. Well, I think now we've begun to realise that, in fact, missionary is the right term for people anywhere who are seeking to do God's work and to be witnesses to him. When Jesus left his disciples in the Ascension, and you can read it at the first chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, he told them to be witnesses, first of all, in Jerusalem, the place where they lived. In some ways, the most difficult place to be his witnesses. And then he said, go to Judea, the area around it. And then go to Samaria, nearby place, but people were regarded a bit as enemies. And then to the ends of the earth. The starting point was where they lived. I remember reading about a lady who was called to God's service and work overseas. I think it was Isabel Kuhn. And the society she went to decided that she should have some relevant experience in this country first. So she went to a Christian settlement, and she found it very hard going there, and wondered what on earth she was doing there. But she thought, well, it'd be okay when I'm actually a missionary, and I'm working overseas. God will get it all sorted out then for me. And then she went overseas, and to start with, she was attached to a senior missionary doing rather um, ordinary things, rather uh, simple things. And she didn't get on all that well with that situation either. And she thought, oh, well, um, I'll work through this. It'll be all right when I'm really a missionary and when God has got me this work for me, this special work for me, that I shall then go on to do. And then when she went to do more experienced work and working by herself, She then thought, ah, I now realise that actually she was called to be God's missionary in all those periods of work preparing and leading up to what she was now doing. They weren't separate to it. They were part of being a missionary. And the key is that we are missionaries wherever we are. You and I are called to be missionaries where we are. And at the moment, for us, that means here in Shipley and around this area. But what does it mean being a missionary? Well, it doesn't mean being an evangelist. Jesus didn't tell his disciples to be evangelists. He told them to be witnesses, which is a very different thing. Michael Frost puts it like this. He says, being a missionary is taking seriously a calling to alert others to God's reign and rule. And he gives a little example, which is quite a good example, really. He says, it's a bit like being a trailer to a film. 
A trailer gives an indication, often in a very dramatic way, of what is in the film. And it leaves people at the end of it saying, yeah, I want to see that film. It doesn't always do that. Sometimes I see these trailers and I think that's the last thing I'd want to go and see. <laughs> but that's the object of it. To get people to say, yes, I want to see more. I want to know more about it. And you see, we want people to see in us and in the church something that makes them want to see more, want to find out more. That's how I first found faith in Jesus. At the Bible class I went to, it was a boys' Bible class. You can tell how long ago it was. We weren't allowed to meet with the girls. <laughs> and we were 11 to 15-year-olds. The thing that made the difference were the lives and the examples of the young men who led that group. And it made me want to find out more about this faith, what it was that was central to them and made them the sort of people they were. But how can we go about indicating in our lives what the reign of God looks like to us? Michael Frost suggests four main areas. He calls them reconciliation, justice, beauty and wholeness. And you may find some of these quite surprising. But actually they're quite good little pegs to hang on the idea of what it means to be a witness, to be a missionary. It's not all about telling people about the faith. It's about a lot of other things too, about what people see in us. And he starts with reconciliation because that is central to the gospel. The gospel is all about how God acted in Jesus to reconcile us, mankind, humankind, bringing us back into harmony with God himself. And that's what that Bible reading was about that we started with. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. As we become means of reconciliation, people can then see that this is a reflection of the God who reconciles. So what is this reconciling aspect of God's reign? Well, if we think of it in practical ways, it might be mediating at work between two people who don't get on, who are actively hostile to each other. It might be repairing an estrangement in a family or with a friend. It might be, well, sharing something of the good news of God who reconciles us to himself by opening the way to us to return to him and discover his love. Whatever it is, it's about bringing harmony to broken relationships. The question for me and for you is, where have we been a reconciling agent in the last month? And then there is justice. Much of the history of the church is a history of, dis a history of disaster, really, of conflict, oppression, and the unjust exercise of power. But there have been many bright instances where Christians have recognised that message in the Bible that God stands with the poor and the powerless to uphold their dignity and their well-being. Historically, it's very often been Christians who have led the way in things like the abolition of slavery, factory and prison reform, the defeat of apartheid, the promotion of human rights. And Christians are active today in many movements to overcome poverty, promote fair trade, support refugees and care for the environment. Now, of course, it's not only Christians who are involved in these things and care about them. But when we work with others over those things, it is a witness to a God who looks for justice in the affairs of this world. And the question for me and for you this week is, where have we done something to advance the cause of justice in this last month? And then he comes to beauty. You may think that's a strange priority for a principle of mission. What on earth has beauty 
got to do with mission. But actually it isn't. Because you see, God created this world to be a beautiful place that we can enjoy. And beauty is part of God's nature. So if we're able to help others to appreciate the beauty there is in creation, or the beauty there is in created works of writing, music, visual images and art, even food, then we are witnessing to something in God that can speak to people. The question for me and for you is where have we shared the beauty of some aspect of creation or some created work with someone else in the last month? And then finally, there is wholeness. In a way, this draws things together a bit. When John the Baptist asked his followers to check whether Jesus was really the Messiah, John was in prison at the time and no doubt a bit depressed about everything and the way things were going, and he must have doubted and thought, well, is, is this Jesus really the Messiah who was promised? Is he really the one who's come from God? And the answer of Jesus to those followers is to go back, go back and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus' ministry was about restoring broken people and bringing wholeness. And of course that means all of us, because we're all in different ways broken people. So whenever people are healed, whether it's through medical or therapeutical means, or by supernatural healing, or the healing of relationships, it's all part of God's desire for us to have wholeness in our lives. We can help people to see how God is at work in these ways of bringing wholeness. And that's a witness too. And the question for me and for you today is where have we helped to heal something that has been broken in the last month? And then finally, Michael Frost goes on to suggest something that I actually find quite difficult. He suggests that we write down each week the ways in which we have alerted others to the universal reign of God in Christ in these four ways, these things we've been thinking about. Basically, to keep a journal of it. That's a long-standing Christian spiritual discipline. Now, I have to hold up my hands here and admit that while some find keeping diaries very fulfilling... I don't feel very positive about writing down lots of stuff. And yet I know that students who write down notes on lectures and the books that they read will probably learn and understand better and do better than those who don't bother. And I know that a lot of people wear fitness monitoring gadgets. How many wears a, how here wears a fitness gadget? Yeah, there we are, you see. And I know that with those gadgets, it means that they can record the steps that they take, it monitors them, all sorts of stuff. Um, things like, um, I can't find it, what I've written down about it, I haven't got one. Sleep patterns, calorie intake, what else does it record? <laughs> yeah, steps, where, how far you've been, things like that, and much else. And it's fed into a computer or, or a phone, and. What it is, is a way of journaling someone's fitness situation and improving it. And people find that a great help. So maybe I need to think again about this idea of keeping a journal. The point of it is that it gives a very tangible way of reflecting on what we are making our priorities in life. And it helps us to relate them to what we are increasingly discover in the Bible is God's way for us. It helps us in a way to start to shape the way that we think about ourselves and our identity as people who are sent by God to alert others to his reign of reconciliation and justice, beauty and wholeness. And there's no greater calling than that.